Jericho. Then the student stood up nervously and told the teacher, Sir, I'm not the one responsible. The evaluator looked at the teacher and the teacher before he could be asked the same question stood up and said, Sir, I'm not responsible either. And the evaluator was a little bit disappointed. He left the classroom and went to the principal's office to report of what had happened. And the principal comforted the evaluator and, sir, and said, Sir, don't you worry. We have the budget for repair. And the evaluator was more disappointed of what had happened. He knew what was happening in that school. And just the same thing. I said, the first statement, biblical illiteracy in our church is all-time high. So our greatest job is to unchain the Bible to the pew. The question asked is, who is reading the Bible? I don't know. Let me ask you this question. Or sometimes I am hesitant to ask this question, but this afternoon I will take my courage. How many of you have read, you have read your Bible at least five times in your life from Genesis to Revelation? May I see your hands? Five times. Okay. One. Only one. How about three times? So another one. How about one time reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, good. How about the others? Not reading the Bible? Now, the next question that I would like to ask is, in the last three months, how many of you have read your Bible at least three times a day at least 15 times or 15 minutes each time you read the Bible. In the last three months, three times a day, at least 15 minutes each time you're going to read it. In the last three months, regularly, three times a day, one. Okay, thank you. When we went to Israel in the year 1998, there were about 200 Bible teachers from all our universities and colleges, Adventist universities and colleges around the world. And one of the lecturers asked the same question. You Bible teachers and theologians of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, how many of you for the last three months were reading the Bible at least 15 minutes every time you read it three times a day. And I was surprised. I was there. No one from among the 200 Bible teachers around the world were reading the Bible at least three times a day, 15 minutes each time that he will be or she will be reading the Bible. So, the challenge of 1998 is still our challenge today. Our greatest job is to unchain the Bible to the pew. Many of us are eating our physical food three times a day, but so few of us are eating our spiritual food 
from listening to the message of God through reading the Bible at least three times also. And what can you expect from those individuals who are not eating regularly? There are three chains that I would like you to remember this afternoon. Why the Bible is not being read. Three chains. Number one, affluency. What is affluency? The tendency to be self-sufficient. No need of scriptures. Many of our people, as I listened to them in my 15 years of my ministry, especially when I visit our churches outside this campus, when I ask them this question, they say, well, Pastor, uh, sometimes we have our worship service in the evening and sometimes we have our regular worship in the morning. That is enough. I am listening to the one who is reading the devotional book. That's enough. Well, some others say, Oh, I am attending the Sabbath school. And our Sabbath school teacher is discussing the lesson very, very carefully, scholarly. That is enough. Just listen. Don't read the Bible. And uh, they say, it is enough. And some of our people will say, <clears throat> well, our worship in our home is not regular, but still, once in a while, I listen to the Word of God, but not regularly being fed by the message of God from the Bible. So, the Bible tells us in the Deuteronomy, 8.3. And I would like to read this verse. If you have a Bible with you, it is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. I'll be reading from the New International Version. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This was the text that Jesus quoted when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. If this is important and this is true, how come that so many from among the Christian world are not being fed by the Word of God regularly at least three times a day? And we have given the reason because of affluency. No need of the scriptures since you have your worship, even though it's not regular, it is at least being done in your home. That is the first reason. The second reason is our theologians have termed it academia, which means studying the Bible than to study the Bible itself or studying about the Bible. Oh, one of our students told me, well, sir, I have my Bible or uh, Sabbath school quarterly, the teacher's edition. And he is relying so much on what the Bible commentaries are telling and uh, has been written on that Sabbath school quarterly. So, he was so much studying about the Bible, not 
studying the Bible itself. So this is one uh, other reason why the Bible is not being read. They are just studying the Bible. And this is a very dangerous thing. And this is the reason why there are more than 570 religious denominations in the Philippines. Because they are studying about the Bible. They are not reading the Bible by themselves and they are not being fed directly by the message of the Word of God. So, the other chain is academia. Let me just give you a precaution. My Bible teacher, when I was in Lagaview College, cautioned me personally. And he told me, Moses, kindly take note of this reminder. Even our Bible commentaries is not exactly what God wants us to study. There are so many dangers in it. It is not perfect. And so many other Bible commentaries. Be sure that you are going to study the Bible itself. Not just rely on these Bible commentaries. That's why these Bible commentaries are being revised. Adventist Bible commentary have a new revision. So I challenge you, be very careful of what you are doing. Then the last. Okay? The last chain why the Bible is not being read is apathy. What is apathy? <clears throat> it is an ambiguous attitude towards the scriptures. Ambiguous attitude towards the scripture. They say the Bible is a minor book and the quotations from the scholars as the textbook. Well, if you are going to trust that the Bible is for the scholars alone and ordinary members of the church have no right and have no privilege to study it for themselves, that is a very strange idea. If the Bible is not for you and for me, then perhaps I will have a little doubt on the God who is the author of this book. I read the writings of Ellen White in the book, Steps to Christ, page 102. And she said, The Bible was not written for the scholars alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. So the Bible is not written for scholars. If ever you're going to talk with the scholars, I hope that you're going to expect that these Bible scholars will give you the message in the simplest form which could easily be understood by ordinary reader of the Bible. This is what Ellen White emphasized. The Bible was not written for the scholars alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. This is a good book. This is the Word of God. It is relevant for me today. It will be relevant for me and for you tomorrow. And it will be relevant for us every day. So, let us break the ties that keep the Bible in the hands of our people. There are three things for 
our people to be found in the hands of our people. And we can break these ties that is holding them to read the Bible at least regularly. One of these first reasons that I would like you to know this afternoon is number one, kindly demystify the tools. The Bible is not a magical book. I repeat, the Bible is not a magical book. I remember our experience about eight years ago. It was 11 o'clock in the evening. I was sleeping soundly when I heard a loud knock at our door. And then I was forced to wake up opened the door and found out several students, one of them a ministerial student, and told me, Pastor, someone is being devil-possessed in one of our dormitories, Cadena Hall, and we would like you to help us pray for this lady. And I was a little bit nervous. Devil possession? I was not used to ministering to these people and to this experience. So I went to my neighbor, Pastor Amurao, and woke him up. Pastor, kindly help me. Our ministerial student is here with some other students and asking for help. And Pastor Amurao was so kind. He went with me. We went with a group of students in the Cadena de Amor Hall. And when we arrived there, there was really a certain young lady who was so strong. She was being held by eight other lady students. But she was moving with strength. And as if that these eight students could not hold her on her bed. Then I saw one of the ministerial students holding his Bible. And when he saw me coming, he put the Bible on the head of this student who was being devil-possessed. As if that this is a magic book. And then he shouted, Satan, get out of this lady. But instead of getting out, she was given a very, very heavy strength. He moved her arm and the Bible was thrown to the face of this ministerial student. And she was terribly shocked. And then one of the students shouted, Pastor, please help us. Then I said, please relax. I asked for the Bible. And I asked the ministerial student, please sit down first. Please lend me that Bible. Then when he handed me the Bible, I began to read the Bible. And after reading some portions of the Bible, then I told these people who were with us, I hope that you believe in prayer. I hope that you believe in God. So join me and we are going to pray with Pastor Amurao. Pastor Amurao prayed first, and he prayed quite long. Then I was opening my eyes once in a while because I was watching for that lady, what she would be doing while Pastor Amurao was praying. And when it was my turn to pray, then I prayed. But I prayed very short. After my prayer, then that young lady cried. And then she felt that she was so weak and asked for a cup of water. 
And one of the students gave her a cup of water, and after drinking that cup of water, she told us the story how she was possessed by the devil. And as if nothing had happened. But that was not the end of the story. After two months, this lady was possessed once again in a history room right there near the accounting office. At that time, I was in my office and called once again, but by the different group of students. I didn't know what to do. Pastor Amura was, there, was not there, and I was all alone. So I requested all other students, okay, let us bring this lady to the clinic. And while they were traveling to the clinic, I went to the house of Pastor Palmero. And Pastor Palmero was so kind to go with me to the clinic, and I requested him to pray. And we prayed. And then we read the Bible, and the message of the Bible have changed the life of this young lady. She's no longer being possessed by the devil, but she became my regular counselor. Now, how are we going to break the times that is holding our people to read the Bible? Demystify the tool. Don't make this a magical book. And I would like to add to that story that while Pastor Palmero was about to pray, the same ministerial student asked me, Pastor, why not tear one of the pages of the Bible? And we are going to burn it. And we are going to put the ash on one of the glasses and then put water and let this uh, patient or this devil possessed drink that water. Is there power from the lips of the Bible? I don't think so. So, I did not mind that suggestion, but I just say, okay, let's just read the Bible. The Bible was written to be read. I think this is the main emphasis. Number two, Humanize the teachers. Sometimes a student defies the teacher, scholars and authorities as mini gods. Don't just demystify. Let's humanize the teachers of the Bible. And uh, I'm sure that if we accept that we are humans, then we can be more of our success in letting our people study the Bible and read it regularly. We have the authority of giving the three angels' message vulnerable. And we have to teach the students, I am a mere man. Just show the students what reading the Bible hath done with you. If I have not read the Bible many times, I won't be here in these institutions. I look at the end of my Bible and found out that on um, last, uh, what is this? Let me just read. Last March 2, 2011, in the College of Theology at 3.30 p.m., I was able to read this Bible as the tenth Bible that I have read. The tenth Bible. Then, that month of April, I started studying my Bible. Just the same, I have received a big Bible, thematic Bible, and now I am continually studying my Bible. Not only reading, because I believe that by reading the Bible, I will be changed. Now, number three and the last. Uplift the true interpreter of the Bible. Who is the true interpreter of the Bible? 
John 16:14 said, "The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth." The Holy Spirit is the only one who could give the true interpretation. In fact, in the Old Testament, Zechariah 4:6 says, "Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit," said the Lord. So, I challenge you, if you are going to demystify the tools, if you are going to humanize the teachers, and we are going to uplift the true interpreter of the Bible, just like William Miller, he studied the Bible with the use of Cruden's Bible Concordance, and he was able to discover the deeper truth of the Bible for himself and for those people around him. Let us just remember that the life-giving power of God is based on the message of the Word of God. Because all of these scriptures is inspired by God. What does it mean to be inspired by God? It simply means that the message of this book is infallible. So, the shortest and the best definition of inspiration that I have learned that I would like to share it with you is this. The infallible message of God written in the fallible language of men is the Bible. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is alive and is powerful. I say the Bible tells us that the Word of God is alive and is powerful. What does it mean? John 1, 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, God, was with God, and the Word was God. Simply means that this book is the written Word of God. The written message of God for you and for me. But Jesus is the living word of God. The life-sustaining word from heaven. Let us remember what Jesus quoted. Man liveth not by bread alone, but by every word means but by the living word of God, which is God himself, no other than Jesus Christ. There is no extraordinary power from just this simple book. This is the message of God, but we have to read it. Now, the, at the back of this written word of God is the living word of God which is sustaining our lives today. Without the living Word of God, all of us will not be found in this place. And we should be thankful that we are not living by bread alone, but God is sustaining our lives through the power of the living God. So, we have known the three reasons why this book is not being read regularly. And we have studied three ways in which this could be fruitful in our lives. The challenge that I would like to leave you this afternoon is, there are two things that will happen when the Bible is read, as it should be read. Number one, there will be a revival and people will begin to leave the message, the transformation in our lives. There will be greater assurance of salvation. People will be helping people to see Christ. That is revival. And the second thing that will happen if the Bible is read as it should be read, is there will be reformation in our church. 
and we are going to see what Christ has done for you and for me. Let us remember, people of God, this afternoon. The Word of God is powerful to sustain us through the life of the living Word. May God bless you this afternoon.